Mars is the target of Elon Musk's colonization goals. But why? It's a thousand times further away than the moon. It takes almost nine months to get there, and you can only launch every two years. Why not choose the moon as the main target for SpaceX's Starship? I'm going to get down into the pros and cons of a mission to either in today's video. The moon is the obvious target for manned spaceflight. It's nearby, trips take only three days, and missions were done in the 60s, which means we certainly have the tech for it. And NASA and the US government are already funding a return to the moon. The moon has been the focus of manned spaceflight for the past 50 years, and rightly so. The first advantage of the moon is its proximity. Any problems in a lunar colony are much less of an issue than on Mars. This is because the travel time is so long that a colony would have to be effectively self-sufficient as launch windows open up only once every two years. Launch windows are a complicated solution to what seems like a very simple problem. When you're launching to another planet, you don't actually launch when the planets are closest to each other. Instead, you launch when the delta V or change in velocity needed is the lowest. This kind of transfer is called a Hohmann transfer which I think is best illustrated in the infamous rocket simulator, Kerbal Space Program. This is achieved by an escape burn done in low Earth orbit that will raise your orbit so that the highest point of the ellipse just matches the orbit of the body you're trying to reach, in this case, Mars. And then, when you've achieved the rendezvous, all that's needed is a simple arrow breaking or capture burn. These transfers can be sped up slightly if you have a more powerful rocket. But until we invent something like the fusion engines you see in the expanse, we're constrained by orbital mechanics to launching to Mars every two years. Otherwise, you just end up flying past the planet with no chance to capture. The distance between Earth and Mars also gives rise to another problem, radiation. Astronauts on the ISS are protected from the brunt of radiation by the Earth's magnetic field. Transits to the moon are also less risky thanks to the relatively short time it takes to get to it. Martian transfers, on the other hand, take much longer to complete. Ranging from six to nine months, the crew will be subject to two main types of radiation, galactic cosmic rays, mainly caused by ancient supernova, and solar charged particles. Galactic cosmic rays are made up of three types. 90% are solitary protons or hydrogen nuclei, 9% are helium nuclei, and 1% are the nuclei of heavier elements like carbon, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, and iron. And although these elements are relatively rare, they still pose a big health risk due to their massive nature. For example, an iron-26 nucleus accelerated to near the speed of light has an energy measured on the scale of millions of electron volts. This can be compared to the energy in the more common proton, which is measured on the scale of 10 to hundreds of electron volts. Such an energetic particle can rip straight through even heavy shielding and damage DNA. Apollo astronauts reported seeing bright flashes on trips to the moon, which were likely caused by high energy cosmic rays impacting their retinas and optic nerves. Cosmic rays can also impact surrounding material around astronauts and irradiate it, leading to even more secondary radiation effects. Thin metal walls, like those on the ISS and those planned for starships, would actually increase the radiation dose for the astronauts. High energy particles would slam into the thin wall and cause a shower of secondary particles to rain down on astronauts further complicating the design requirements for an interplanetary starship. A possible solution to this is hydrogen. It's the best element at blocking cosmic radiation and can be incorporated into starship and other deep space vehicles in three ways. The easiest choice is plastics. Due to being composed of tons of hydrogen atoms, they can offer a lightweight solution to prospective Martian colonists. The second way is incorporating water reserves into the shielding. This would be a mass sufficient way to make use of the otherwise heavy and relatively useless water stores. The third option, although it's not really viable for most conventional spacecraft, is storing your fuel around the habitat, especially if it's liquid hydrogen. 
Since Starship uses liquid methane, this really isn't that much of an option, but for a purpose-built Mars transfer vehicle, this could be used. And when Martian colonists finally touch down after a months long cruise, the radiation they will face will almost be as bad as it was in deep space, thanks to the lack of a Martian magnetic field and relatively thin atmosphere. But this problem can be solved pretty easily by covering habitats with regolith, a similar solution that can also be applied on the moon. Interestingly, exposure to cosmic radiation affects women twice as much as men, thanks to ovaries and breasts which are particularly cancer-sensitive parts of the body. But the moon isn't all good news. A particularly large issue with the moon is the lack of key elements needed for life. Since the moon lacks an atmosphere and the magnetic field, the solar wind and extreme temperatures it faces have stripped the surface of many of its volatiles. This means that most of the lunar surface is more barren than any desert here on Earth. This means that for most purposes, especially habitation, the poles of the moon are really the most likely and only place for long-term sustainable human exploration and colonization. And this is certainly known to NASA, whose Artemis program plans to land at the South Pole, which is preferred to the North Pole by most for the fact that it possesses the most craters and therefore the most permanently shaded areas that are perfect for the accumulation of volatiles like water ice. This was recently discovered by the L-Cross Impactor and Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. The L-Cross Impactor was comprised of two parts, a Centaur upper stage and the Shepherding spacecraft, which was designed to record the impact and analyze the debris for the presence of water on the lunar surface. Water was found in the spectrum, and in 2018, NASA announced the presence of water ice on the surface. This changed the game for human colonization, as it means that water ice, which is crucial for long-term habitation, as water is needed for both the production of oxygen and the production of fuel. Other molecules necessary for life, however, like nitrogen and carbon, are not readily available on the moon, and are needed for any kind of long-term presence, which means any lunar colony will be dependent on outside sources for its sustainability. On Mars, however, there is an abundance of volatiles. The Martian atmosphere is 95% CO2 and it's 2.7% nitrogen, meaning both are in abundance. Oxygen and hydrogen can be liberated from subsurface ice deposits, and metal ores are expected to be in abundance. Mars's many volcanoes are a testament to the conditions needed to create them. Mars also possesses much more possible area for habitation. While lunar colonization will likely be limited to the poles, Martian colonists have the entire planet at their disposal. Mars's day-night cycle is also much more forgiving. Actually, with a day length of 24 hours and 37 minutes, it's eerily close to an Earth day. This makes solar power a real possibility on Mars, and Elon has already said this will be the path forward. Widespread use of solar power on the moon, however, will be much harder, as it has a 28 day long day, and the 14 day lunar night is too long for most batteries to handle. This means nuclear technologies like kilopower will likely be needed to power most long term settlements. Although there has been research done into solar towers, which will extend hundreds of meters above the lunar surface, past the shade, and into perpetual sunlight. Trans Astronautica is one of the companies looking into the concept, and I was fortunate enough to attend their presentation at the Moon Society's Lunar Development Conference. They look like they've put some real thought into a lot of their concepts, but like most space companies, they're mostly just blueprints. Mars also offers more long-term prospects for human expansion. Its low gravity means that launching rockets off it is much easier. For example, Starship, while it needs super heavy to reach orbit off Earth, it can reach orbit on Mars by itself. This makes it so much easier to use Mars as a staging area for future exploration of the solar system. It's very possible that Mars can maintain its own launch industry in the future, being dependent only on computer parts from Earth. You can already see the start of this with Starship. It's relatively easy to build and can be fueled with methane made on Mars. This is especially true when you consider Phobos and Deimos, whose large water ice and possible metallic deposits could aid in the construction of orbital habitats and other space in space infrastructure. 
Mars could act as the gateway for future human exploration into the outer solar system. Saying definitively whether one should colonize the moon or Mars is hard, if not impossible task. Mars definitely has many pluses, but honestly, the moon's proximity is really hard to beat, especially when it comes to NASA, where most plans for a Mars mission consist of a date and a vague promise. The moon is a great target for NASA as it's achievable, and it's a good way to get more funding for the commercial sector, which I think the current NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, is doing a great job of doing. He's been commercializing much of Artemis, starting with CLPS, Dragon XL, and the human landing system. This is the future for NASA. It should cultivate commercial partnerships and encourage the creation of a robust space economy. But that's a topic for another video. Mars also deserves attention, and government funding will also be needed to step in. Colonizing Mars is a long-term goal, and it's gonna cost a lot of money. NASA should step in and shoulder some of the burden, especially since the possible payoffs are huge. So in short, the moon is the perfect stepping stone to establish the viability of a space economy, while SpaceX and other private companies act as trailblazers for the next step of human expansion, Mars, whose potential for long-term habitation is unmatched. The aerospace field is more than capable of colonizing both, and I hope to see NASA, commercial space companies, and international partners return to pushing the boundaries of manned human exploration.